Great, thanks Grant. Um, just to say hello, my name is Lynn Jimison. I'm the current chair of Scottish Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. And just to warn you, the way this is set up at the moment, I can't actually see who the participants are. Um, and I can't type in the Q&A myself. So um, because the way that I've come into this, that's just the facilities that I have. So just to warn you of that, if you don't announce yourself um, in the chat, I've got no idea that who I'm really speaking to. So it would be quite nice to have a more interactive dialogue with you. So I've been involved in the campaign for nuclear disarmament, I guess, since about 1980. I got involved in it in that wave when there was a great deal of things happening, as indeed there is again now um, in terms of nuclear weapons. It was a time when new nuclear weapons were cited here, when there were lots of connections around nuclear weapons um, in Scotland, many of which have been, have been maintained, but also when there were cruise missiles in the south of England and when the new Trident programme um, of nuclear submarines, nuclear armed uh, submarines carrying Trident missiles that are built in the United States was coming to Scotland. So I'm going to try and talk through some, some of, um, give you a tour of some things and I'm going to start sharing my screen, I hope. Um, I'm just getting there now, slightly in. And I'm starting with this particular slide just to remind us that the idea that nuclear weapons could ever be used is really incredibly absurd. I mean, we've just had an anniversary on the 6th and 9th of August of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where, you know, in, in one case, there's a hundred, you know, over 100,000 people immediately uh, killed um, and terrible suffering not just for those who were present, but actually for, for generations, you know, harms passed down. And so the idea that they could ever really be a tool of war is um, just absolutely unacceptable. So that's always my starting point is the inhumane obscenity of nuclear weapons. And the fact that my country um, has become so implicated in this is my um, is what's brought me to be a campaigner. So this is a map of Scotland. Um, it, I'm starting with a map that has no roads. It's emphasising the sea, and unlike um, I'm starting with a map that. Unlike many uh, maps that you do see of Scotland, um, has the whole of all of our islands on it. It doesn't quite get in all of Scotland because um, I've cut off a bit of the Solway Firth, but we have at least the whole of the Shetland Islands and we have St Kilda, which is the most westerly island um, 40 miles further out than the, the Outer Hebrides, the islands of Scotland that we call the Outer Hebrides. So it's showing Scotland within the sea, within the Atlantic Ocean and the North Sea. And as a country, we're a very beautiful country, but we are also littered with installations that are military and connected to the nuclear issue. From the very North Isles, we have where we have uh, Saxaford, uh, a, a big radar listening base. We have Instant Kilda also a listening position, which is used for tracking missiles. 
and there is in fact a firing range in the Western Isles. Um, so on that left hand side of the map, you'll see um, a couple of things there. Um, also, we have uh, still have a very a significant REF base, but also that base is used by US military. And there is cons growing concern about its use for US military drones. And so I have a, a kind of little picture on the map there of drones. We have a, still have a couple of nuclear power stations within Scotland and the links between nuclear power and nuclear weapons have been there from the very beginning. And in a, a nuclear armed state that the UK, United Kingdom is, there's always been a deadly connection between the two, which carries on into the present. So we have, I've marked on the map, uh, three nuclear facilities, uh, two of which are generating nuclear power and one in the north of Scotland is no longer active, but it's still in decommissioning and um, has caused significant pollution up there on, there are beaches still fenced off that can't be used because of an accident that happened up there. Um, but it was connected to the military up in, in Dunry on the very north coast of Scotland. I've also got a couple of explosion symbols which show current live firing ranges including one that's fired uranium hardened shells. Um, in fact, it's possible that that's happened in both of those cases. Um, but Cape Roth up in the northeast corner of Scotland uh, still has live firing by, by from the air, from the sea and from the land. But arguably the most unacceptable of all of the places is the base that gets called by its common everyday name of Fast Lane and is um, not very obvious on this map, but it's in relative proximity to the main city of Scotland, Glasgow, and um, it's not so far from, from here in Edinburgh either. And the miles that it is away would of course be less, um, you know, the miles by road to travel there is less for a wind or a bird. So if there are ever to be, if there were ever to be, heaven forbid, an accident, um, the whole of the central belt is downwind as it is from that nuclear power station over in Hunterston, um, which is continuing to run well beyond its sell-by date. So making the map a bit closer so that we see the area where 70% of Scottish population live between Glasgow and Edinburgh. And I now have a red dot on the map um, to mark the site of Fast Lane um, or to give it its proper its proper name, Her Majesty's Naval Base, Clyde. And you can see the Clyde River running through Glasgow, opening out into the Clyde Estuary on the map. And it's a very complicated sea estuary. And that very first map I showed you, I had various submarines dotted about on the map. Um, and I'll talk obviously a bit more about that, but they were, there was a submarine picture over on the Firth of Forth on the Edinburgh side of the map as well. And um, because on that uh, Forth estuary, you also have Resyth Naval Base, which is where the decommissioned submarines that preceded the current ones sit as quietly radiating hulks just sitting there because nobody quite knows what to do with them. Um, because they're of course still radioactive. So I'm going to come back to all of that um, in a minute with another, another map in a little bit more detail. So now I'm starting to put arrows on the map to point out the, and name some of the features on the map. 
and I'm naming some lochs. Um, if we just look at that cluster of arrows in the Clyde estuary on the map and look at them from left to right, the first arrow is pointing to the Holy Loch. And I've written a bit of spiel about the Holy Loch down the side of the slide about the fact that it was a United States base for nuclear armed, nuclear powered submarines that preceded the current UK base that I haven't re yet really fully properly introduced. Um, so that's the Holy Loch, then there's Loch Long, then there is a peninsula uh, which I'm naming as the Rosneath Peninsula, and then there is the Gearloch, which is the site of all of the United Kingdom's nuclear weapons um, carrying submarines. So the Rosneath Peninsula is significant because on the Rosneath Peninsula, there is the Royal Navy Armament Depot cool port. It's actually on the Loch Long side of the peninsula that it's accessed by the submarines. And, or it, maybe it can actually be accessed from both sides. But there, there's a whole series of nuclear bunkers that, that plays host to um, the current bombs, the nuclear bombs that the United Kingdom government has. So let's just go back to the Holy Loch for a moment. It started there as a Clyde estuary hosting nuclear weapons. That's where they were first. And it was at a time when the United States couldn't patrol Soviet waters with submarines easily without a base closer to them. And that's was the beginning of why they wanted a base in Scotland. And you'll see that I've noted there that it left when it did go because they no longer needed it. It left a, a significant legacy of pollution, which took another 10 years to clean up. And I say clean up because we don't know that it was ever fully cleaned up and it cost a great deal of money. Although that great deal of money, 11 million, is a tiny, tiny drop in the, in the ocean of the kinds of costs that are involved in the sorts of things that we're talking about. But I also note that the reason why it was there, rather than somewhere else in Scotland, was because the United States Navy um, and the United States um, Supreme Commander, President Eisenhower at the time, wanted the troops to be able to have easy access to a center of population where they could get rest and recreation. So this was first mooted in 1959 when uh, President Eisenhower proposed it at Camp David to our Prime Minister then Macmillan. And straight away Macmillan was worried um, and wrote in his diary, a picture might be drawn of some frightful accident which might devastate the whole of Scotland. Um, and actually he tried to persuade the Americans not to have it so close to the center of um, population, but to have it in uh, Loch Linney, which is much further north, um, but without success. So, the sighting of this base in the Holy Loch was really the beginning. Um, well, it wasn't actually the beginning because of course the beginning was the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the build up to that. Um, but it was a, a very important episode in this torturous history of the British involvement in nuclear weapons. Um, which has been a history of secrets, risk-taking, pollution, cover-ups, enormous escalating cost, 
and putting the whole world, uh, us participating in putting the whole world at risk. And that is more obvious now than ever before in a time of, of climate change and concern about mass extinction of biodiversity. If you think about the harms that have been done by nuclear weapons over the years of nuclear tests and the, the mess that it's created in so many countries now. So I'm now moving to a map that's showing roads. And I want you to think about the transport of nuclear weapons on roads. So we've been talking about sea, but British nuclear weapons are constructed in Britain. They're constructed in the very south of Britain and they're transported by road to Fastlane and Coalport. And once transported, they have to be retransported because they have a shelf life. They degrade with time and they have to go back to the bomb factory to be refurbished and then brought back again. So that is a regular cycle in its own right. And I'm just going to go back briefly two slides to this claim here about, that I didn't address, the, the beginning of the story of the Holy Loch was a deal about um, missiles for a base. Okay, so the story of UK nuclear weapons is that the United Kingdom's scientists were involved in the design of nuclear weapons from the beginning and those first terrible bombs that were dropped involved the United Kingdom. But then there was a bit of elbowing and jockeying and the United States um, and Britain were each going their separate ways for a bit. And uh, the United States was in some senses wishing to have a monopoly of nuclear weapons. And Britain was trying to develop its own missile system and basically was a failure uh, at developing missiles. They had no problem developing bombs, but did not successfully develop an intercontinental ballistic missile to keep a pace of the Americans. And so this base that was discussed in 1959 was, the deal was to get Britain back with intercontinental ballistic missile cap capability. Now, the roads, go back to my map of roads. Um, and think about transport again, but now remembering, okay, so these bombs are built in Britain, uh, have always been built in Britain since the, since the 50s. Um, but are being loaded on missiles that are provided by the United States. And there's a, a series of generations of missiles that um, are about to be further upgraded, perhaps, unless we can stop it. So this is one of the roads that was shown on that map. It gets called the Glen Fruin Hall Road. And it was built at a time, the time that I got involved, um, when missiles were being upgraded from Polaris to Trident missiles. And the upgrading of missiles also involves the building of new submarines. The whole nuclear weapons system gets upgraded um, around the missiles. 
So four new nuclear submarines were built and were coming to the Geirloch where they're based at this time. And it was a time of enormous opposition. Just as the Holy Loch first being sighted in the Clyde was a time of enormous opposition. Lots of Scottish people um, took part in hundreds of demonstrations, um, including a demonstration against the building of this road. Um, and it was a tiny part of a huge construction project that was on the scale, at least of the Channel tunnel, the building of the channel tunnel. And that's not our um, phraseology, actually. That's not the phraseology or the way of speaking about it of the peace movement. That is the boast of the constructors who were involved in it and want to um, strut their stuff on their CV. They talk about how their involvement in the building around Fast Lane at that time and Coolport at that time was on the, the scale of the Channel Tunnel. So in, in, in enormous cost was uh, involved in this. Um, in today's money, maybe, maybe equivalent to the 205 billion pounds that the renewal of the system that is currently um, supposedly happening um, will cost that CND has estimated it will cost. Now this is a beautiful area of the country, just as uh, the Holy Loch is beautiful, it was a beautiful area of the country. Um, and now this is the roots, showing you the roots of the convoys that come from the factories in Burfield and Aldermaston where the weapons are developed and manufactured um, to Coolport, the Royal Naval Armament Depot at Coolport. And it's showing you images of what the convoy looks like. And it also shows you Brian Quayle, who is one of the members of the Scottish c &D executive and has been um, part of an organization called Nuke Watch, as well as Scottish CND for many years. And um, here was um, trying to, unusually trying to stop a convoy. Um, so these nuclear weapons travel routinely on roads the length of England and across the major population centres of Scotland, um, creating monthly risks of accidents, as well as the constant risks that are associated with having high explosives and nuclear uh, materials together um, in bombs and missiles um, very close to the Scottish population. This is a image of the UK government's official publication, which they called Global Britain in a Competitive Age, the Integrated Review of Security, Defence, Development and Foreign Policy. And this is a document in March where they announced that they were going to increase the stockpile of nuclear weapons by what we reckon is 40%. This is a departure from previous policy that's gone back decades. Now, as the United Kingdom is a signatory of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which uh, has been signed um, by the official nuclear states, not by Israel, not by India or Pakistan, um, but the Non-Proliferation Treaty commits nuclear states to never um, give nuclear technology to another state, 
and it also commits the nuclear states to nuclear disarmament, to take steps towards nuclear disarmament in good faith, leading to total and complete nuclear disarmament. And the United Kingdom has been party to a number of nuclear arms reduction treaties and um, has boasted about its record towards nuclear disarmament. And when it announced this increase in um, stockpile in nuclear weapons, it was in clear breach of its obligations under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And there is a very strongly written legal opinion, very carefully argued, that puts this case. But Nukewatch, that observes the convoys and monitors their progress, argued that they'd seen a significant increase. Well, they didn't argue, they could document a significant increase in convoys over the period before this announcement and believed that this announcement was an after the event announcement and that the convoys that they've seen going back and forward um, indicate that there was already the increase in nuclear weapons that was announced. So each of these nuclear weapons, and on the four submarines, there's eight um, missiles, each capable of carrying nuclear weapons. So the government announcements talking about increasing them to 240, each of these nuclear weapons is many times the um, impact, potential impact of the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And a very, very tiny nuclear exchange with those kinds of weapons would be enough to cause catastrophic, catastrophic climate change. Um, to put so much muck in the atmosphere, there would be immediate cooling and failure of crops. It wouldn't solve global warming because of course it would have also have enhanced carbon. Um, and ultimately we would go from failure of crops because of, of cooling back to an even higher level of global warming. Okay, so this is a picture of a fast lane itself um, of the installation as it looks today. And the large shed on the right is the ship lift that is capable of raising a Trident submarine um, from out of the water so that it could be worked on, um, which is an enormously expensive and huge piece of kit in itself. It's very hard to get a sense of the scale of this um, from a photograph that is um, well back up on the hillside. Um, but you're seeing the ship lift. Uh, you're seeing the several of the piers, including the pier where Trident submarines sit and appeared where other submarines sit. And some of the facilities um, where the personnel who work there uh, are housed and carry on their activities. And it, there's probably only about a thousand people work directly on Trident related activities. Um, and they're all skills that could be readily transferred to other activities. Uh, if and when the space um, goes, there is no need for people to become um, unemployed. There is time for a just transition and to make sure that people can transition into socially worthwhile jobs. Um, provided the planning happens now. This is what the area around it looks like. Um, this is just up on the hillside off that Glen Fruin Hall Road. This is the road that goes over to Glen Douglas. And this is what the infrastructure looked like before the, the military um, had taken it over 
and we're building. Military also controls this part of the road, um, but you can see the older signpost to Glen Douglas. This is a bit blurry, a slightly blurry closer up picture, but you can see there is in fact a submarine sitting there um, on the berth for the Trident submarines. And all of these activities have ongoing pollution. So the Ministry of Defence has, has made an application to the Environment Protection Agency to increase the discharges into the Gearloch of radioactive material. And they've tried to soften this in a number of ways, but Scottish CND objected or wrote a, a, a letter of objection, which um, just recording what we think about it. So tritium is the main nuclear hazard that is emitted into the loch. And it is a, a very hazardous internal emitter is how it's described technically. And as well as being discharged from the nuclear reactors of the submarine, it's also found in the general effluents that are discharged, things like sewage and oil. So the Scottish CND position is that nuclear weapons will go fastest from Scotland if Scotland becomes an independent country. We're in the position at the moment of having a Scottish government who are committed to um, trying to bring another referendum about independence. And they are also committed to signing a treaty that came into effect in January of this year, um, the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Now, this is a treaty that has been signed by a large number of states who are non-nuclear and who have got um, tired of waiting for the nuclear states who signed the non-proliferation treaty to actually take serious steps towards nuclear disarmament and who recognize the inhumane nature and unusable nature of nuclear weapons and have brought about a treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Now, because there is a treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons, it means there is already a framework that an independent Scotland can immediately join. And because there is such a framework, we would have the solidarity of an international community to support us in getting the United Kingdom to remove, or the remainder of the United Kingdom, which wouldn't then be as it is now, to remove those nuclear weapons from Scotland. And um, that is a very real prospect, and there are already quite detailed plans about how that should happen. And so I'm going to stop with this um, quote from the First Minister, the current First Minister of Scotland, um, stating her commitment to ridding Scotland of nuclear weapons at the time of the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons entering into force. I'm going to stop there and see um, whether there are some questions and we can get into some uh, dialogue. Um, I've spoken for about half an hour and I think it would be there are, there are many more things that I could talk about in somewhat greater depth, um, but I think it would be quite good now 
to uh, just check in with you about what's being said and to see if we could get into some dialogue about some of these issues. I see we've got someone here from Aaron um, on the Clyde estuary, in a sense, in the Clyde, almost looking into the Clyde estuary from the Isle of Arran. Um, and somebody from Tayport, the River Tay being the next estuary up from the fourth. We don't have any questions in chat that I can see. Are there any um, questions in, in chat, Grant? Then are you okay to stop sharing yes. screen? Sure, yeah. yes, of yeah. course. Uh, just the, chat, the questions from early on at the start of the meeting. So if you click on um, participants, so you, you'll be able to see it. I think there's, I think there's 16, 16 attendees. I can't so, see. Uh, I can't see that. Okay, that's no. maybe only that's possibly only me that can see that. Yes, I can't see. Mm. You haven't enabled me to see participants, so I can't see them. Right. Okay. Um, there is the possibility of asking your question directly. I can unmute you, but if you either raise your hand or or ask in the Q and A. Uh, I can do that and you can ask Lynn directly if that's easier. Or perhaps everybody's just enjoying this lovely <laughs> Scottish weather. <laughs> and is looking forward to uh, getting back to whatever they were doing. Um, actually, yeah, that's quite possible. There's a couple of things to say about um, COP26 and the future events. So, some people will be aware that there is a demonstration this Saturday at Fastlane, or it's a, a rally, um, which is not called by Scottish CND, it's called by um, All Under One Banner. But Scottish CND are calling an event at Fastlane on the 26th of September, which is a Sunday. And it is, um, it's, we're hoping to create a a fairly sort of visual spectacle of an event. Um, the, on a Sunday, the base is, is closed, but we hope to have a, a visual die-in event at the North Gate at Fastlane. Um, and we're trying to make the link with the marine environment by asking people to bring images or dress as uh, sea creatures. Um, to make that connection between the harms of um, nuclear weapons and um, militarization and the marine environment. Um, and COP26 in the beginning of November is, of course, a period where, again, we want to try to highlight the links between nuclear weapons and environmental issues. And there'll be, there's quite a lot um, going on about that on our website, um, www.banthebomb.org. And um, we'll keep updating there uh, about what's happening during COP26, that people hopefully would maybe be able to uh, get involved in and uh, help us make that link. Uh, it's a, I think the threat of nuclear annihilation and the threat of climate change are sort of very, very tied together. And, um, you know, from the whole cycle of nuclear weapons, from uranium mining 
um, through to the horrendous waste that the nuclear industry creates. Um, the cycles are very interlinked and so it would be very good to have people um, helping us make those connections. Um, I don't know whether you know, but I mean, Britain has got a huge stockpile of plutonium, which is toxic for thousands and thousands of years, like beyond um, imaginable numbers of generations. Um, so that is a legacy of reprocessing from civil nuclear power, but that reprocessing really only made sense in the context of nuclear weapons. And um, the current nuclear industry, we believe, is still promoted by government because they need the critical mass of a nuclear industry to support the nuclear weapons industry. And so the, you know, the research development, the expertise of um, training and so on needs that kind of critical mass. And that's why, despite all of the possibilities of renewable, uh, the government still commits itself to a nuclear power plant. So Lynn, if I could just um, interject there, I've got two concerns here. First of all, I'm worried that your dog is wanting his dinner. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we also have three questions from the attendees, which hopefully you'll be able to see in the Q&A there. If you look at the bottom of your screen. All right, now I can see them, yep. Okay, so how do we get the realities of the dangers of nuclear weapons across to people? Many just dismiss them from their minds. Thank you for that, Grace. Yes, that's true. Um, but it, I think it's also true that a lot of people haven't quite focused on them and that the anniversaries of Hiroshima and Nagasaki are very important in that sense. Um, but are you thinking that there are a lot of people who do know exactly how horrendous it is and they still just are not um, prepared to be engaged? And I think if that's the kind of people, if, if that's what you're thinking, then I guess it's trying to other messages, I suppose, are then become more important, like the ongoing enormous cost that is currently being spent every single day on nuclear weapons um, is something that I think pe some people do respond to um, and that we maybe do need to keep highlighting. Um, and also the risk of accident. So the awareness of the convoys coming, I don't think is quite as high profile as, as we would want it to be. The fact that they're passing by um, many people's doors uh, is, is also uh, something that maybe we need to try to bring out more. But you may have other answers yourself. I don't know if you want to come back on that, do you? Is it possible to let Grace speak? Yes, it is. If you give me a second. So Grace, um, yeah, you, yeah I've, I've unmuted you, so you yep. should be able to talk. Right. I think it's, I get the impression, and I've been at a couple of the Hiroshima Memorial Days, that so many people just don't even know about it now. They don't know about nuclear weapons or they've forgotten how, how horrendous the effects are. And you get people like Donald, the late um, President Donald Trump, who seem to think that he could um, explode a bomb over China and it wouldn't affect anybody else. How do we get yeah. people to realize how dangerous these weapons are? Because yeah. I do think they have, they've sort of fallen below the, the uh, horizon for so many people. Yes, yeah, yeah. I think the, um, the, obviously the media don't always do us a great service in terms of trying to report things that we think should be uh, reported, but we, there is a piece, Scottish Peace Education. Um, so one of the things that we can work on with this government, I think, 
is making sure that uh, peace education is in every school and that it is high quality and, um, and, and honest about the horror of it. Um, I mean, obviously there are, you know, I don't want to, I wouldn't necessarily want to expose very young children to um, some of the most hard hitting kind of um, material because it is very, very distressing. But nevertheless, um, I think by the teen years, everybody does need to know just exactly what the impact was of a nuclear bomb, you know, so that, you know, the stories of people dying slowly in agony, calling out for water, you know, trailing their skins behind them and so on, those kinds of um, accounts that uh, the Hibaksha have, have left us and some who are still with us can, are still telling, um, do have to be passed on. Um, they, it can't be shied away from. So yes, I'm completely with you. Uh, but so I think education work is, is incredibly important. So it's, there's no quick fix to this. It is all the unromantic slow grind of uh, keeping going and trying to up what we know we should always have been doing uh, and trying to find ways of doing it better um, and doing it more. Uh, but maybe, I don't know, do you, have you got other thoughts about it, Grace? Well, I'm part of um, Pax Christi Scotland, so I think uh, fortunately with our current folk, we're getting much more support now on the anti-nuclear side. Uh, and I must be in fairness to the Scottish bishops, they've been there for quite a while. So we're still pushing that and trying to get to people through um, other um, things they're involved in. Uh, but I think the peace education is very important, getting through to our secondary schools to get them thinking about it too. Uh, I think people will be very comfortable. We've all, uh, uh, my generation, well, just slightly after the, um, the, the Second World War, We've lived through a very comfortable time. Some of us still remember the Cuba crisis and how frightening it was. The majority of those who are slightly younger have never known any concern about it. So it's getting them to think, you know, you're, you're, you're shutting your eyes to this very dangerous set of weapons that are sitting in our countryside. We need to be thinking about, do we want this danger for our children? And do we want to be wasting so much money on it when that money should be getting used, as the Pope said, for things much more important? Yeah. Absolutely, completely agree. Yes, yeah, yep, completely agree. Um, I wonder if I should just go to, um, there's a question here from, um, but feel free to come back in, Grace, really, honestly, if you want to say something else about it. Um, sorry, there was a question from Sheena about the refurbishment of missiles. Uh, the, it's not the missiles that's refurbished, it's the bombs themselves. So when the submarine docks, the missiles are un, and bombs are un, usually unloaded if, the, if anything else is gonna to happen to the submarine. So if it's gonna have any kind of refurbishing kind of work on it, or um, if it's going to be out of action for a period, they take the, uh, or off patrol for a period, they take the, the missiles and bombs off. Um, and that's when they go in the bunkers in Coalport. So it's the bombs themselves uh, that get sent back to Aldermaston and Burfield for refurbishing. And it's because, um, it's not because they become unstable in the sense that they would um, accidentally detonate, but that they maybe wouldn't work as intended. Um, they wouldn't maybe go off as intended. So uh, some of the elements in them, and particularly tritium, um, degrades in a way that means they have to keep replacing it. So that's what's going on there. Um, so it also means that the, the, if you just took the bombs off and just left them for long enough, um, they wouldn't want to use them. So actually, in that sense, uh, you could just um, make the bombs 
all of the missiles and the submarine is disarmed. So disarming it in, in, a, in that kind of way immediately is, is relatively easy. Um, does that answer that, Sheena? Okay. I'll give Sheena um, permission to talk if you hang on a second. Sheena, you're, you're joined twice, so I'll have to allow both of your uh, accounts to talk. <laughs> You okay, Sheena? Yes, that, that's answered my question. Thank you very much. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and is there anything else you wanted to say while you've got the floor? <laughs> no, that's fine. Okay, so Catherine Muir, you asked um, about risk assessment. Uh, for the transport and whether that information is publicly available and you don't really understand how they get away with it. The fact is that transport is one of those, it's one of those strange issues where um, the UK government sends us these uh, convoys, but of course the Scottish government is responsible for uh, safety and so are local authorities of, of the Scottish people. Um, but they don't have any jurisdiction over these convoys, um, but they are supposed to be responsible for um, emergency planning and responding to uh, incidents. But they, they don't get a uh, notice that would allow them um, to do that really in any effective way. Um, so it is, it is a, a shambles in that sense. And Akiko, is asking about protection of attacks. Um, and that picture uh, I showed of the convoy, there are military police vehicles there with them all in between the transporters carrying the, the nuclear weapons. So they do have um, transport, they do have police um, accompanying them. Uh, in that sense, there is protection, but um, that doesn't stop accidents and it doesn't stop incidents. Um, so there have been a couple of sort of near serious incidents where um, vehicles have gone off the road, um, you know, because they're coming in all, all weathers and all conditions. Uh, so yes, so that is a serious, a serious issue. Um, I don't know if either of you wanted to come back. Yes, can I, Akiko Haga, uh, can I ask a little bit more? For example, yeah. if the, you know, although there's a police or military protection, but for example, if anything is sent to the you know, convoy with using a drone, for example, I can't see any protection to be very honest. No, you're right. Well, that's true. I mean, it is, it's quite a large target once it's moving. Yeah. Um, if, if there was a really determined uh, terrorist um, organization that wanted to target them, then of course that would be possible that that could happen. I mean, let's face it, Nukewatch um, can track them. So, so could somebody else, um, you know, Nuke Watch is people like me, it's ordinary everyday people who are, um, don't think they should be on the roads, want us to know about it, don't believe that, that this thing should be happening at all and are trying to create pressure to stop it happening. Um, but um, somebody with much more malevolent intent could have a, a setup uh, tracking them and uh, mountain attack. Yeah, also you mentioned, you know, Scottish government or local authority are not informed. Maybe that is a, you know, like informing that lots of people might be danger to leak that information. But I believe these convoys can't run, you know, 70 miles per hour that are coming slowly. And once coming from south, south of England, you know, 
a plenty of time for them to prepare to attack in Scotland, I believe. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. Is that something that, you know, can we challenge the British government in court or something? You know, may, may not be UK court, but something like an international court, etc. The current government has shown relatively little regard for the courts um, and international law, I'm afraid. But yes, um, the certainly the Scottish government could be thinking more about their own powers and what challenges, um, whether there are further ways they could mount challenges. Um, and obviously we as a civil society could be trying to think um, more about those kinds of ways of challenging, but um, they're not, um, it's not obvious, immediately obvious. Um, so the legislation about the safety of um, people <laughs> is written by government. <laughs> yeah. Is that any yeah. police involvement? Because I think police itself is a devolved issue. You know, army is not devolved, but police is a Sc under Scottish government. Yes, that's true. But if the, any police involvement, is there anything we can do about it? Um, I'm not sure if I'm completely following you, but the obviously there's a separate military police mm -hmm. um, from the Scottish, the Scottish police who are answerable now, really answerable to Scottish government. They used to be answerable to local authorities, but we now have a one unified Scottish police force. Mm -hmm. So the local authority connection has been somewhat diluted in the way yeah. that the police currently operate. Yeah, but if police are involved, because police is under Scottish government, yes. if Scottish government say no, is there anything you know, we can make an impact yeah. for, for UK government to do convoy? Well, you can't imagine a situation it's in it is inconceivable at the moment to imagine a situation in which the scottish government would order the scottish police to um refuse to allow the convoys to come on the scottish roads because that would be a direct confrontation with the uk government that would be seen as a breach of their powers um and uh, could go and you know, could become, a, I'm not quite sure where that would go, um, but the UK government would definitely pull rank. But it's an interesting issue. It is an interesting issue when you start to think about it more radically like that. Anyway, thank you very much. Yeah, no, interesting question. Um, do we have another one? Or have we answered them all? And, there was uh, one anonymous question right at the beginning, and I don't know if uh, obviously we're getting we're just over time. I mean, there is a yeah. little bit more time if you want. But so, what was the? Oh, what are your thoughts uh, about the US? Oh, yes, dominance. Both yeah. with regard to when Macmillan was prime minister in the more recent. Yes, well, yes. Um, I mean. I think the, that relationship between Eisenhower and Macmillan is exemplified by um, the inequality <laughs> that has carried on ever since. Um, you know, the UK has, in order to carry favor with the United States, basically had to do as they were asked to do. So, Macmillan concedes the base um, very close to Glasgow when he was um, somewhat uncomfortable about it and certainly didn't want it that close to the centre of population. Um, and it's been like that, I think, ever since that kind of, that is the power hierarchy after all, that is how it is. But um, Britain shouldn't be trying to be 
uh, an, a, a world superpower um, or a nuclear state. We should be joining the majority world that is trying to face the rest of the world collaboratively in cooperation and in peace and in working together to solve global problems, not spending their money on um, putting their neighbors at risk of mass extinction. So yeah, and the United States is still modernizing its nuclear weapons um, under the current president. Um, there, isn't, there hasn't been a change of direction in that sense. Um, there has been on climate change, but not any recognition of the, not any very radical recognition of the harms that are being done through nuclear weapons and the mass military spending of the United States. 